Hello, BCC. I'm Nick Parker, the Children's Minister here at Bridgetown Church of Christ, and I am here with Kevin and Kathy Davis. In the summer of 2024, they are going to be a part of the team that's going to Redbird Mission in Beverly, Kentucky. Kevin and Kathy have been going to Redbird for 10 years, both on their own and on short-term mission trips like the one BCC will be doing next summer. So Kevin, Kathy, thank you for being here. Thank you. So tell us what is most exciting to you about this mission trip? Well, this particular mission trip to me is exciting because we've been attending BCC for about, ten, about a year now. Mm -hmm. And it's just wonderful that we have the opportunity to share this mission that we've been passionate, and I do mean passionate about for yeah. all these years, to just share what it is like to go over the threshold of the camp at Redbird and feel the presence of Jesus mm -hmm. on the grounds and then also to go into people's houses mm -hmm. and just um, meet the people that are in dire circumstances mm -hmm. with no water, no electric, and, wow. and but yet they, you can feel just the, their love for Jesus um, just there in the mountains, in the hollers. Mm -hmm. We get the opportunity here at Bridgetown to go and share the love of Jesus with them mm -hmm. and also help them with so many needed things. I, I really like it. Redbird from the standpoint of you get to take people to a place that they've never been before, mm -hmm. they re never really thought about it, um, and they get more out of it than they put into it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the folks the, on the trip. The folks on the, more, on the trip. Yeah. We had a lady um, who went with us several years ago and basically had to, had to twist her arm to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, She decided to go. I was very excited. We went there, we came home, I saw her the next Sunday. She said, she said, Kevin, you didn't tell me that this was gonna be so hard. And mm -hmm. I said, I don't understand, what do you mean? She says, I want to go back, I want to go back now. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. And that was the impact that she had, yeah. that, that Redbird had on her. Had on her, that's amazing. Well, our hope is that by hearing a little more about Redbird Mission, that you would consider joining the team that's going on this mission trip next summer. And so if your interest is piqued, Kevin and Kathy and others who are going to be on this team are gonna be in the fellowship hall downstairs right after church. And you can come and talk to them. You can learn more about this trip. There's not gonna be any commitment that you're gonna be required to make today. And let me just say, if you have kids in Bridgetown Kids, no worries. You can take them with you or feel free to just pop down, let their teacher know that you're going to the meeting and we will make sure to keep them safe and having a good time while you go learn about this really cool opportunity. Kevin, Kathy, thank you again. Thanks, Dan. kind of starting an applause. I don't really know what's happened there. Uh, my name's Mike, and I have uh, the privilege of serving as one of the leaders here at Bridgetown Church of Christ. Um, and I'm glad you're here, whether it's your first time, your thousandth time, or somewhere in between. Um, I'm glad you're here with us today. Um, I want you to participate in a little uh, thinking exercise with me. I want you to think over the course of your life, what is something that you've greatly anticipated? Or maybe it's something that you're greatly anticipating right now. Right? Maybe uh, you have historically or are currently anticipating a specific holiday or the holiday season. Uh, maybe you anticipate the weekend. Maybe you anticipate some relief from something that you're dealing with right now. Uh, 
maybe you're looking forward to a vacation or a trip that you're going to be taking. Uh, I know for myself and my 13-year-old son, Chase, we're really excited to be going on the mission trip uh, to Red Bird. almost said the wrong name. Red Bird. I keep hearing Red Bud in my head. My brother-in-law lives in Red Bud. And one of my fellow elders, Lathan, his company's out in Red Bud, so it's like stuck in my head. Red Bird. Okay, and Kevin was given the, the props up there, very good. So, Red Bird, there's some more back there, awesome. So, with my 13-year-old son, uh, Chase and I, we're going there next summer to Red Bird, and we are super excited to be going on that mission trip. You saw that video before service started. Uh, if it's something that maybe you're, it's piqued your interest and you're thinking about doing that, um, I know after watching that video, it made me even more excited to go. There's a Q&A session in the fellowship hall right after service, and uh, you can check that out and get some more information and see if maybe it's something that you, uh, you want to do and join us on next summer. Like I said, Chase and I were really excited, we're really looking forward to it, been talking about it frequently, um, about doing that next summer. In anticipation, right, it can change depending on life stage, right? Maybe if you're a student, you're anticipating graduation or that first uh, professional job, or maybe, uh, maybe you're in a relationship and you're anticipating marriage. Maybe you're a married couple and you're anticipating the birth of your first child or your second or your fifth, right? Who knows? Um, maybe, you're, maybe you're excited about buying your first home or, or selling your current home and moving into that new home. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe you're getting ready to leave the job you're in. Maybe it's leaving the workforce altogether in retirement, right? My house right now, the biggest anticipation going on is uh, from my kids. We're going to Walt Disney World over Christmas, and it's a time of super excitement for them. I am uh, less excited and anticipating my uh, credit card bill when we get back. I'm looking forward to the trip itself, but, um, but the bill itself is, is less exciting to me. For me, I love the month of October. It's my favorite month of the year. Sorry, I'm having a technology. I'm anticipating technology working, and uh, I'm stuck. My teleprompter is stuck. So I'm going to uh, temporarily go old school here while we look at that. Um, so I've got, I've got some of it memorized, don't worry. Um, but for me, October is my favorite month of the year. I love uh, the month of October. And now that it's here, today's October 1st, I'm anticipating all of the exciting things that come with the month of October. Uh, one of the things I'm looking forward to this month is uh, a new thing we're doing here for the first time this month uh, in October, on October 13th, a Friday night. We're going to be coming here, uh, here at BCC in the Grassy Knoll area over at the side there. Uh, we are going to be having uh, cooking hot dogs, we're going to be making s'mores, we're going to be doing all kinds of uh, fun stuff together as a family. It's just going to be a good time of fellowship together as, uh, as our church family gets together to do that. And I'm really, really excited about that. My kids are excited, my family's excited, and we're really excited to be a part of that together. So, um, sorry, like I said, I was anticipating technology and everything just uh, went haywire, but that's okay. So. Um, another thing, sorry, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. I'll get there. Um, another part of October that I really, really enjoy is uh, I get to have two Thanksgivings, which I, that's not just some weird thing that I do personally, um, although it's tempting. No, I'm from Canada, which if you know me, you've heard me say that before. My family's from Canada. Uh, my brother lives there, my parents, my aunts and uncles, my cousins, they all still live up there. And so in Canada, not just my family, Canadians in general, we we have Thanksgiving in October. Uh, it's something to do with the harvest. It comes earlier. I don't really know. I don't ask questions. I just know I get to enjoy two Thanksgivings. So that's what works for me. So I'll be doing that uh, actually next weekend. I'll be enjoying some, some Thanksgiving food early. So Now last week, uh, Eric opened our new series on Mark, and he talked about the anticipation that the Israelites were having and we're feeling about the expectations of the coming Messiah. And we read about John the Baptist preparing the way. We read about Jesus bapt or about him baptizing Jesus and about that spurring on Jesus' earthly ministry here on, here on earth. And in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 1, we read about Jesus calling his first disciples and he's healing the sick and he's casting out demons and he's preaching to the masses. And in the very last verse of Mark 1 and verse 44, 45, it says, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus, and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in a secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. The crowds were flocking to him, and he was beloved. And then in chapter 2 of Mark's gospel, we see a different reaction to Jesus. The crowds, the same people who loved and, and wanted to be around Jesus so much, they've turned against him. And they hate him now. And so what in the world happened between chapter 1 and chapter 2? 
See, in chapter 2 of Mark's gospel, he, he highlights the conflicts and the opposition that Jesus faces when encountering the Pharisees and the scribes. See, the scribes, we read about them a lot in the gospels, and they were, uh, they were a sect of Israelite culture who were very learned men, and their business was to study the law, transcribe it, and write interpretations of it and commentaries on it. They were hired if there was a need for a written document um, was, arose, or there needed to be an interpretation of a specific legal point. They were, uh, they were teachers of the people, and they were interpreters of the law, and they were widely respected by the community because of their knowledge, their dedication, and their outward appearance of law keeping. Now, the Pharisees, they were known for their emphasis on personal piety, on being religious, on being reverent, and they taught that all the Jewish people should, ab should abide by and live and observe all the 600 plus laws that God gave them in the Torah, which is in the first five books of the Old Testament. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they're often linked together, they're seen together, particularly in their interactions with Jesus. And while they had different names, they had similar practices. They went beyond the interpretation of scripture, and they added a lot of man-made laws and traditions to what God had said. They became professionals at spelling out the letter of the law rather than the spirit behind the law. And they got to the point where the regulations and the traditions that the Pharisees and the scribes added became more important than the law itself. And the traditions and teaching of these groups was adding man-made additions to God's word. And Jesus very clearly told them that this was forbidden and that these teachings were merely human-made. See, these very learned and scholarly men, they didn't take kindly to being challenged and not to being challenged with such authority as Jesus was bringing. See, these people, these scribes and Pharisees, they all lived in the backdrop of the Israelite belief and understanding that a Messiah was coming. And Eric talked about this last week, and, and so I want you to go back with me to anticipation and to things that you're anticipating. See, the Israelites, including the scribes and the Pharisees, they were anticipating a Messiah who would destroy evil, destroy their enemies, and then establish an eternal kingdom where Israelite would be the preeminent nation of the world. See, again, Eric mentioned last week that the Israelites believed that the Messiah would come and he would deliver them from the Roman bondage and he would set up an earthly kingdom where, there would be, where they would be the rulers. And the prophecies that they read, they, they specifically talked about this coming Messiah being a, a suffering Messiah who would be persecuted, who would be killed, but they kind of started, viewed more his his victories rather than his crucifixion. See, they didn't see Jesus as this promised Messiah because he didn't meet the expectations that they had for him. And we have the hindsight of 2,000 years of history. We have the New Testament. We have Jesus' teachings and teachings that we've heard. We have all that that the Israelites didn't necessarily have when they were living under Jesus' ministry. And yet, as Christ followers, I think we often suffer from unmet expectations when it comes to Jesus. See, we get hurt we get frustrated, we get sick, loved ones get sick, people die, pain and suffering happen, and we know all this, right? There's no denying that this happens, and yet we expect different, I think, right? We make expect expectations of Jesus, and we get upset when they're not met. See, I've made these expectations, right? That that person would get better, that, that one of my kids would, would make this choice, that, that that job that I wanted would, would come, that this thing in my life would get figured out, that circumstance, whatever it is, because I had the expectation that Jesus would do it. And see, here's the thing. We get on this path, right? And we decide that we're going to follow Jesus. We're going to make him the Lord and King of our lives. And in doing that, we get our, ourselves off the throne of our lives, and we invite Jesus to sit on the throne. We take our crowns off and we hand them over to Jesus. And when Jesus becomes the ruler of our lives, he takes control and we, we, we have to let it go. Does that mean there's no pain? Absolutely not. Does it mean that I'll never worry or struggle? I, I, I don't have to, to worry, but I do. I do because I set these expectations of what's going to happen and what my life's going to look like and how this thing's going to work out. I anticipate the things that I want Jesus to do in my life and in, in the lives of others that I love. But see, the key word here is I, right? I reach back and I say to Jesus, you know what? <laughs> I don't really like the way things are going right now. I think I'd like you to maybe get off that throne and let me sit back down and, and take control again. 
right? That crown I handed over, I think I'd like to take it back and put it on my head because things aren't really going the way I expected them to go, right? See, Jesus is going to challenge our expectations, and if you're not sure, look back at Mark chapter 2 with me. If you have your Bible journals, you can look at Mark 2, starting in verses 1 through 12. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home, and soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door, when he was preaching God's word to them. Four men arriving, arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof on his, above his head. And they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. And they were all amazed, praising God, exclaiming, we have never seen anything like this before. Now, if that story sounds familiar, especially coming from me, I, I preached about this last, uh, last spring, this specific story. But I want to focus here on where the paralytic gets forgiven of his sins. See, it says that some of the scribes, they're sitting there, and they're questioning in their hearts, and let's be honest, probably with their faces, right? What's this guy doing? How on earth is, can he say this? Only God can forgive sins. This Johnny come lately can't come and forgive sins, right? He has no business talking this way. But Jesus, he's kind of the new guy on the scene, right? And he's teaching the people in a new and a different way with, with great authority that the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they hadn't seen yet. And they enter this scene at this house, not because they, they love Jesus or think he's great. They don't want to tell people, man, I, I got to see Jesus. That's awesome. They're there because they're skeptical of Jesus. And they think he's a false teacher and they want to be able to prove that that's the case. See, the crowds, they've been flocking to him and the, and the scribes and the Pharisees, they're getting jealous and they're starting to question this. See, whatever it is they were anticipating or expecting from Jesus that day, they got something completely different. See, Jesus sees this man come through the roof and he sees his friends and he sees the faith that his friends and the man have, the faith that Jesus is who he says he is. And he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Like I said, I don't know exactly what the scribes and the Pharisees were expecting that day from Jesus, but that this couldn't have been it. And they start perceiving in their hearts, in their minds, that he has no business forgiving anyone's sins. That's God's role exclusively. And see, the scribes, they, weren't, they were using the right kind of logic, right? They, they were correct in believing that only God could forgive sins. They were correct in even examining this new teacher, but the, the error they made was that they didn't see who Jesus is, that Jesus is God the Son, and Jesus has the authority to forgive sin. And Jesus showed this legitimate authority that he had that, to forgive sins, and that's not what the people expected that day. Now, what about the paralytic, right? He gets up that morning, and he goes with his friends, and he's anticipating that Jesus is going to allow him to walk. And at least initially, it doesn't look like that's going to be the case, right? The first words he hears are, your sins are forgiven. And that's not what he was anticipating. And I have to imagine, I put myself in his shoes and think, man, I, that's, that's not what I was expecting. That was not what I was hoping for. And there was probably some disappointment, right? But eventually his ability to walk is restored to him. And he's healed. But the reality is this man, he came with a certain expectation as well. He's anticipating one specific thing, a physical healing. What he got was something far more, something so much bigger. He got God's forgiveness, Right? There's nothing bigger, there's nothing more that he could ask for. He didn't anticipate that. He didn't even ask for that. But Jesus knew that that's what he needed the most, was forgiveness of his sins. See, sometimes we come to Jesus and we seek specific things that we want. Sometimes, sometimes we get what we want. Sometimes Jesus gives us what we need. Sometimes, I know this is my experience, we, we don't feel like we got anything, what we wanted or what we needed. How many of us have ever approached Jesus like the, like the scribes? We come to Jesus and we're not sure what to expect, and then we leave frustrated or dissatisfied because we didn't, we, we didn't get what we wanted. We didn't get what we, we thought was ours, what we should have from this. You see, the scribes, they didn't know who they were dealing with, 
but they knew they didn't like what they were seeing. On the flip side, how many of us have ever come to Jesus like the paralytic? See, I've come to Jesus anticipating him to do something specific, and he, he surpasses that expectation. I've come to him sometimes, and he's given me exactly what I've asked for. Sometimes, though, I haven't gotten what I've asked for. That's, that's just real life, right? And, and truthfully, I'd love to tell you differently, but I've, I've been frustrated, and I've been saddened when I didn't get my expectations met. See, sometimes I think we like things that we can control, right? I've, seen, I've never seen myself as a, as a control freak. You can ask my family, they may think differently. Because I do, I see fingerprints, they're laughing. Well, I hope they're laughing at me and not like laughing like, yeah, no, you don't know, right? I, I, I see fingerprints of, of, of a guy who, who can't keep his hands off the wheel, has to be the one in charge in so many areas of my life. And see, it goes back to who's sitting on the throne of my life. Who's wearing the crown in my life? See, when I encounter Jesus, control is something that I need to lay down because Jesus doesn't fit into any sort of a box that I want to put him in sometimes. At the beginning of service, Kyle read from Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 22, and specifically in 13 through 17, we read about him calling Levi, the tax collector, and we find out that Levi is Matthew, the disciple of Jesus. And tax collectors, they weren't liked by the Jewish people regardless. And Jewish tax collectors were absolutely abhorred by the Israelites. See, a Jewish tax collector who was collecting taxes on behalf of the Roman government who was oppressing them, that was seen as a form of treason. And the the tax collectors, they're dishonest people. Their whole salary is made up by by over-collecting from people. They would give them false tax figures, and then they would pocket the leftover money as their salary. And there's Jesus, he's sitting and he's engaging with in conversation and he's dining with these tax collectors, these sinners, the the New Living Translation (laughs) said the Pharisees called them scum. Jesus was a friend to sinners, the sinners know this and they respond to Jesus' love and offers of friendship. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they see this unfolding and they say to his disciples, why is he doing this? Why is he defiling himself sitting with these degenerates? These traitors, these vile sinners, this scum, as the, as the New Living Translation said. See, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, remember, they, they, they pride themselves on personal piety, on religion, and on reverence. They're not going to be seen rubbing elbows with tax collectors and, and sinners, right? Let alone be, be known as friends to these people. And yet they look on and they see Jesus sitting there with these degenerates, these traitors, these tax collectors... And Jesus hears the Pharisees' questions, and he answers them by saying, it's not, the, it's not the well who need to go see a doctor. It's the sick. See, I came here not to call the righteous, but to call the sinners. See, just like the paralytic who received physical healing, yes, but he also, even bigger, the greatest thing he got was, was a spiritual healing of his soul when he was forgiven of his sins. And Jesus tells the Pharisees and the scribes in no uncertain terms, I came here to heal the world's biggest problem." sin. I didn't come here to spend time with people who who like to think they've got it all figured out. I came here to spend time with the people that need me most, the sinners. And I came here to fulfill their greatest need, the forgiveness of their sins. And that's why I'm sitting here right now incurring the judgment that you're giving me. See, as much as we want to control things, I can't control, I can't have control when I encounter Jesus. He challenges me to get out of my areas of comfort and do things and talk to people and live a life that's that's selfless, and it makes me really uncomfortable sometimes. That's just me being honest with you. See, I can't put Jesus in a box, and it's tempting. I can't have my relationship with him be nice and neat and tidy and on my terms because that's not how it works. Jesus doesn't meet those expectations. And see, for the Pharisees, if he was really this great and wise teacher that he said he was, he'd be in the temples and he'd be teaching, you know, the right people, right? Right? But he didn't. He surrounded himself with everyday people, with sinners, with people who needed to hear his message and receive his grace and forgiveness. What about the tax collectors and the, and the sinners? How many dinner parties are they getting invited to? Probably not that many, right? How many of them expected such love and such compassion, such an investment in their lives? Jesus defied their expectations too. See, how many people ever said to Matthew, hey, come follow me, come have a meal with me? If anything, it was probably like, yeah, you, get away from me. Oh, here comes that tax collector, go the other direction, right? And I wonder how many of these, these, these tax collectors and these sinners had experienced that. And I wonder, too, how many times the Pharisees and the scribes, probably more than anyone else, 
pushed these people away from God rather than drew them closer. And see, Jesus, he takes the expectations and he flips them upside down. And he embraces these people and he invites them into his life and he loves them and thereby shows them the true kingdom of God. See, the Pharisees and the scribes, they wanted to stay in their lane and they wanted Jesus to join them in that and be okay with that. They wanted to stay in their area of expertise. They didn't want to be challenged and they didn't want to be stretched. And like I said, they wanted Jesus to be okay with that and join them in that way. They wanted Jesus to fit this preconceived box the Messiah would fit in. Check all the boxes that the Messiah was to check off. Jesus doesn't fit in a box, right? We can't keep Jesus in a box. We can't say... I want to live this way, and, and I want to do this, and I'm just going to take Jesus with me wherever I'm going. He'll just come along with me. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. See, I, I, I said at the beginning of the sermon how October is my favorite month, how I, I love all the things about October. I anticipate things. I'm looking forward to this event on, on October 13th. Of having hot, I don't even really like hot dogs that much, to be honest with you. Uh, I like s'mores. They're pretty good. They're messy, but they're good. But I'm looking forward to spending time with my church family and having fire pits. I'm looking forward to the cool air of the fall and just getting to spend that time. I'm looking forward to a second Thanksgiving next week. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, I like food, let's be honest, right? But one thing I really, really love about the month of October is I'm a big sports guy, so I love baseball. I'm passionate. And, like, playoffs start on Tuesday, so it's, like, playoff time. I like football, right? I'm 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 a Bengals fan. And... I just love doing that this time of year. So, so if you're from Cincinnati, you root for our teams. Our Reds just got officially eliminated from the playoffs yesterday. It was a heck of a season, right? Nobody saw that coming. Our Bengals are one and two, right? Playing Tennessee today, fingers crossed. But if you're from here, you root for those teams. This next question might, might resonate a little bit closer with you. What happens when the things that we anticipate don't deliver? What happens when we have unmet expectations? And depending on what it is, it can be pretty crushing, right? For me, it could be the simplest thing. You know, I'll be at work and I'll be thinking, tonight I'm going to do this and this and this, and then I can do whatever I want. This weekend, I'm going to do this and it's going to be great. And then I get home and I see all the leaves in my backyard. And I go, oh, that's right. I look around my house and I see all the stuff that, you know, I told my wife I I do. And I'm not saying handiwork stuff. That's not me. I'm talking like dishes and laundry. (laughs) And uh, you can laugh. It's okay. It's true, though. And I look at all that and I go, oh, man. Yeah, I guess I got to do that too. I forgot about that, right? And I'm reminded of obligations that I have where my kids want or need something and I feel like my whole evening or my whole weekend got hijacked, right? Because things didn't go the way I wanted them to go. I make expectations of my employers at work, of my students. I'm a teacher. I make expectations of their parents. I got parent-teacher conferences tomorrow and Tuesday and uh, I'm making expectations of how that's going to go and I know my mind's going to be blown at least a couple of times I'm going to look at my co-teacher and go, did that just happen? Did we both just witness that? Okay, I just want to make sure I'm not going crazy here, right? Because I make these, anticipa- or these expectations. I have anticipation about these things. And I'm not saying any of this is right or good that I feel this way or I react this way. But it's just real life, right? When things don't turn out the way I want, I get frustrated. I feel, like I said, I use the word hijacked. I feel like my day got hijacked, my weekend got hijacked. And see, at the beginning of this message, we talked about anticipation, and we talked about in chapter one of Mark's gospel, there was excitement for Jesus. He was loved, he was sought out by the people, but the tones changed, something's happened. And we see exactly what Jesus came here to do. And it wasn't what the scribes and the Pharisees anticipated or expected, and frankly, it wasn't what they wanted. And and it's not always what we want today, quite honestly. See, when Kyle read from Mark chapter 2, he also read a passage from uh, verses 18 through 22 about fasting, right? And it's kind of a weird passage, and I had to read a lot of commentaries to kind of figure this out. And so the Pharisees, they were well known for fasting twice a week. I figure it's probably some sort of a public production because people knew about it, right? John the Baptist and his disciples, they were fasting mainly because their ministry stressed repentance. And they were mourning the sin that was in the world, and they were preparing the way for the coming Messiah, You see, that's why Jesus and his disciples didn't fast, because they had the Messiah with them. And so people notice this, and they start coming up and saying, why do you fast and you don't? What's the story with this, right? And Jesus gives them kind of an odd response, right? He asks them if wedding guests would fast while the bridegroom was with them. And then he tells them there'll be a day when the bridegroom will be gone, 
and the, the wedding guests will fast at that time. It'll be more appropriate that time. Like I said, it's a weird response. But what, see, what Jesus is doing is he's drawing on a very powerful picture amongst the Jewish people. See, weddings in Jewish culture were, were something huge. They lasted for like a week back then. And during that time, the rabbis would declare that joy was more important than observing religious ritual. And see, what Jesus is saying is, I'm not the Pharisees, I'm not the scribes, I'm not John the Baptist. I'm the Messiah. I'm the bridegroom to the people of God. See, wherever I am, it's appropriate to experience that type of joy like you would have at a wedding. I would imagine if you asked any sort of a a Jewish person back then, what's your favorite thing to do? They would say, oh man, it's going to weddings. It's a week's worth of eating and drinking and having fun with friends and fellowshipping and just pure joy. And Jesus is saying, that's the type of joy that you should have when you experience me, when you're with me. It's, it's no wonder that the very first miracle he did was at a wedding, when he turned the water into wine. That, that, that's how Jesus is saying people should be reacting to him and experiencing him, because he knows that he's not always going to be with them. He knows that his physical and immediate presence would not always be with the disciples, and when he's physically gone, it'd be more appropriate to do things like mourning and fasting, right? And then the next part, Jesus sounds like, I don't know, like a tailor, a tailor or a, a sommelier. I think I said that right. I had to look it up. It's a fancy word for wine expert, okay? I'm not a wine expert, so I don't know, right? But he's talking about patching up new clothing, using, or old clothing using new pieces of cloth, right, uh, that hasn't been shrunk yet. He's talking about putting new wine into old wine skins. And on the surface, it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? It seems like Jesus is going on like Martha Stewart's like DIY craft show or something and talking about like, you know, how to do that. It's like, after commercial, we're going to be talking with Jesus about how to, how to do, sew up some things and how to avoid spilling good wine and breaking a good old wine bag, right? So we all know that with Jesus, right, it's never surface. There's layers and layers and layers. See, Jesus is saying there's a danger in putting something new on something old. And he's using the garment and the patch illustration for that. But the same principle applies to the wineskins. A wineskin would expand under the pressure of fermentation. So... If you put new and unfermented wine into one of these old and brittle wineskins, it was sure to burst, right? My guess is that most people that were listening had probably done one or both, right? They've experienced this. See, Jesus knows his audience, and he knows how to bring things that apply to them. But see, the point Jesus is making is you can't fit his new life, this new life that he offers you into your old forms. Jesus flipped everything upside down to the people living back then and for us today. See, the law that the Pharisees and the scribes were insisting that the Israelites lived under, the expectation was this Messiah would come and he would uphold that law and allow his people to be the rulers of his earthly kingdom under those very laws. And Jesus, he traced the spirit of heaviness that came from living under the law for grace through faith, whereby people are made right with God. See, Jesus came to introduce something new, not just patch up something old. Not something broken. And that's what salvation's all about. For the Pharisees and the scribes, the people, or the Jewish people at that time, he challenged the system. He didn't meet their expectations that they had for the Messiah. Jesus isn't interested in cleaning up something, making it look nice. He isn't interested in patching up a crack, covering a hole, or putting a band-aid on a broken system. The system that people had put above God and above worshiping him. See, Jesus isn't looking at your life, at my life today, and saying, man, if I could just get in there and spruce that up just a little bit, it would make everything better. If I could just put a Band-Aid on that one broken part. See, what Jesus wants, what he requires, is complete transformation. This is not what people in Jesus' day expected. They expected upholding and further promotion of the law, not grace, not love, not authentic sacrifice where a sinless and perfect individual would lay down his life for all of mankind to forgive them of, and save them from their greatest need, which is sin, separation from God. But that's what they got. And that's what we've got. See, today Jesus requires complete transformation of our lives. No longer can we get off the throne of our lives, hand the crown of our lives over to Jesus and say, hey, could you just keep the seat warm for me for a little while? I'll come back and resume ruling my life here in a little bit, right? Hey, could you just be a placeholder for my crown? When I come back, I'll take it back from you, right? Change my mind. I want it back. It doesn't work that way, right? We can't hand our lives over to Jesus 
to just clean up the messy parts, to band-aid the broken stuff, put some stucco on the walls of our lives and live like a house on fire and expect it to keep standing. See, Jesus didn't come, he didn't lay down his life so that we could just paint over the ugly parts of life and make it look like we got it all figured out. Complete transformation means the old is made new, the old self has passed away. We cannot try to fit Jesus into our old life, our old ways. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Just like that in Ephesians 4, 20 through 24, it says, But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt, through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. See, when we encounter Jesus and we make him the Lord of our lives, there should be no more turning back to living the lives we used to. Yeah, we're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. We all do. That's part of life. But the overall is new. It's different. It's not just having the brokenness covered up but made right. See, Eric said this two weeks ago when we introduced the new website, and it's true. Here at BCC, we believe that with Jesus, better is possible. We can choose to no longer be like the Pharisees and the scribes and have unmet expectations of Jesus because he isn't what we want him to be. He isn't doing what we want him to do. Instead, we can choose to be like the paralytic who sought one thing specifically and got his mind completely blown. And his first and greatest need was met when he received forgiveness for his sins. And ultimately, he saw his expectations for Jesus get totally surpassed. See, here's the thing, and the sadness and the frustration of unmet expectations stems from a place of selfishness for all of us, not just for me. See, I'm not getting what I want. I'm not getting what I feel like I need. I don't get what I feel is owed to me. And I'm often reminded, and I'll tell you truthfully, not right away, it takes a while. I'm often reminded that maybe while I didn't get what I wanted, I've been given the greatest gift I could ever ask for, Jesus. My sins have been forgiven. I've been freed from the bondage of sin. Jesus is best. And so in Jesus giving me my, himself, I'm getting best. We could choose not to be like the Pharisees and the scribes and try to fit Jesus into a box that we want him to fit in and compartmentalize our faith and have control. Instead, we can look at that we can be like Matthew and his friends and accept the call, follow me, and accept that invitation to the table to be embraced and to be loved and to be invite, involved in a relationship with Jesus. And finally, we can choose to no longer be like the Pharisees and the scribes and hold on to the things that we hold so dear, so important, yet they're so heavy we can't even keep our arms held up. Rather, we can be like those who heard and understood Jesus' teachings that we can't fit the new life that he offers into the old life. But instead, we embrace being made new and completely transformed in, by this relationship with Jesus. I don't, I don't know where all of you are on this journey, but I want you to notice one thing. I didn't say perfect is possible. As much as I'd love to tell you, and many of you probably already know this, following Jesus doesn't make life perfect. There can be times when your expectations are unmet. Yeah, I can guarantee that. Are there going to be times when you wrestle with relinquishing that control or wanting back the control that you gave to Jesus? Yeah, I do it just about every day. Will there be times when you just want Jesus to cover up the broken parts of your life that exist in you? If you're anything like me, you definitely want that. And sometimes it feels like there's a lot of broken pieces. And I just want Jesus to glue it up and pat me on the head. If I had hair, I'd say ruffle my hair, but I don't. And just say... Go on, you. Go on and be you. And let me live the selfish life that I have such a tendency to live. See, because I struggle with wanting to have complete transformation. I want to cling to the old mic that is not a good one. See, we strive to be more like Jesus each day. Sometimes we stumble. Sometimes we fall. Years ago, I, uh, I remember suffering through a real crisis. And I talked to my real good friend, Steve, and I said, man, I'm, I'm struggling so much. <sighs> I'm just trying to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this situation. I'm so lost right now. And he said, Mike, hands and feet get dirty sometimes. It was 
stumbling, falling, having unmet expectations, taking back control, resisting full life transformation, doing the right thing and being obedient to Jesus even when our hands and feet get dirty. We don't always understand why we're in the place that we're in, especially when we were led there out of a place of obedience to Jesus. Sometimes we look at where we're at and say, why am I doing this thing, God? You called me to do this thing and I'm doing it and all it's causing me is hurt and pain and heartache. Why is this happening? See, all of that, unfortunately or not, however you want to look at it, it's part of this journey when we walk with Jesus. But for me at least, and hopefully for you, it serves as a reminder that with Jesus, better is possible. So we come to Jesus with these expectations, the things we want, and when we don't get the the temptation is to be disheartened, is to be frustrated. And we forget that Jesus always, always provides exactly what we need. He never fails us. We're going to go into a time of musical worship here in a moment, and we're going to sing the song, Same God. So we serve, and we live under the same God loved and provided for his children and heard the cries of his children back then and he hears our cries today. We're not abandoned. We're not forgotten. We're also going to sing a song we introduced a couple weeks ago called Firm Foundation. And then the second verse it says, because I've built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through every season, so why would he fail now? He won't. He won't let you down. He won't fail you ever. Just know that. Jesus will never fail you because with Jesus better is possible. Let's pray. God, I I just thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your reminders that you are faithful and you are good. And we have expectations. We have things that we want from you, Father, and they don't always come out the way we want. We don't always feel like we're getting what we want. We don't always forget feel like we're getting what we need. But when we come to a life with you, when we come to salvation, Father, we have been given all we ever need in our forgiveness of our sins through the grace that you've shown us, through the love you've shown us, your mercy and your taking on our sin. Father, remind us as we struggle with unmet expectations that you don't fail, that you don't abandon or forget that you are faithful. ways that Jesus has surpassed my expectations, and I suspect yours too, is by giving us the opportunity to have eternal life. He came to this earth and he lived a perfect life, and then he died a horrendous death on a cross. His body was broken and his blood was shed for us. And he did this so that we could be made right and we could have our sins forgiven so that our relationship with God can be made right. And each time when we come together, we remember how Jesus surpassed our expectations with his death on, death on the cross. So we remember together this morning, if you haven't already grabbed the communion, um, you can, they're available in the back there. But as a family, as a church, we're going to take communion together to remember this. So take and eat of the bread and remember Jesus' body was broken for you. Take a drink of the juice and remember Jesus' blood that was shed for you. In a moment, we're going we're gonna to sing together. The worship team is going to lead us through musical worship. And we're spending time worshiping God through song. Think about the unmet, unmet expectations you have of Jesus. Or the times when you try to take back control. Or how the idea of complete transformation of your life is terrifying. And hand those things over to Jesus. And choose Jesus and be reminded that Jesus will never fail. He'll never let you down because with Jesus, better is possible. This morning, in between our musical worship, Mark, one of our partners here, he he is going to publicly be showing us through baptism that with Jesus, better is possible. Yeah, we're going to have a baptism here this morning. I'm excited. that's, That's good stuff, right? Because with Jesus, better is possible. 